Hey, Josh Powers here with Quixel, and today we're going to talk a bit about rendering and presentation. Whether you're posting online for fun or trying to demonstrate your skills to a potential employer, every artist wants his or her work to turn heads and generate clicks. And a high quality render of your art is a crucial part to making that happen. A lot of you have been asking us how we set up our renders, so in today's video, I'm going to walk you through one of the easiest yet most effective ways of displaying artwork inside Marmoset's incredibly powerful tool, the Marmoset Tool Bag. So let's jump right in. With Toolbag loaded up, I can click on this empty material here and then proceed to load each of the individual texture maps for my material. But instead of doing this, I'm going to show you a great way to get your textures from Quixel Mixer into Toolbag via Quixel Bridge. Inside Quixel Mixer, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the setting tabs and switch the PBR workflow from specular to metallic, since the original mix used specular. Metallic is the most common workflow in game engines, so I wanted to use that for this tutorial and show how easy it was to change workflows inside Mixer. Now that I'm finished with this conversion, I would normally go to the Export tab and set up my exporter options for this mix. However, there's a really great way to make this mix ready to be used for any project you might have, and that's by exporting it to the Megascans library inside Bridge. I'll quickly give the material a name, surface category, and then a few keyword tags so that it's very easy to find. And then I just hit save. With the bridge tool loaded up, you'll see a few categories on the upper left portion of the screen. Acquired, Download, Favorites, and finally Mixer, which is where I'll find my recently exported mix. When I click on this material, a menu will pop up from the right, giving me some different export settings. The first thing I'm going to do is change my export to Marmoset and then click Download Plugin. Next, I'll set the installation destination by selecting the plugin folder inside the Marmoset Toolbag directory. But be aware, if you've installed Toolbag with the default installation path, which is under C Programs Files, you'll need to make sure you're running Bridge as an administrator, otherwise the install might fail. Once you assign the path, Bridge will install the Megascans LiveLink importer plugin. Back inside Toolbag, You'll want to go up to the Edit drop down and go to Plugins, Refresh, just to ensure the plugin is loaded correctly. After that, you can go back to the Plugins menu and choose the MS Live Link plugin. So long as this Live Link window is open, Bridge and Toolbag will be connected, allowing you to quickly and easily import assets straight into Toolbag without having to manually set up any of the materials. Now that Live Link is running, I'll simply go back to Bridge and then click on the Export button for my material. And as soon as I'm back in Toolbag, the material is already imported and the texture maps properly assigned in the material. Okay, now that the material is already set up, I'm going to go ahead and close the Live Link plugin and then import a model. I can do this by either going up to File, Import Model, or Control I for shortcut, or I can click this icon here. I'm going to load up the sphere.fbx file. And if you're wanting to follow along, you can grab the mesh files I'm using for this tutorial on our forum, which is linked in the description below, so be sure to head over there and give them a download. Okay, so the thing you'll notice about this sphere is that it's pretty high poly. That's because we'll be using a displacement map. And while we will be able to dynamically add tessellation to the mesh through the material, there is a limit to how much you can add. So make sure that your mesh is pretty high poly already, and then we'll control the rest of it through the material. All right, now that I have the sphere loaded, I'm just gonna go ahead and drag and drop the material onto the mesh to apply the material. Next, I wanna add a new camera to the scene. I can do this by clicking on this icon here or by going to Scene, Add Object, Camera. I'm going to first start by turning on the safe frame mode so that I can see exactly what areas of the viewport will be included in the render and then position the camera until I have a nice angular view of the metal slats. Though I already had a camera in the scene, I like to add a second camera to be my render camera. That way I can switch back to the other camera at any point and move, rotate, and zoom around the scene wherever I want. But my render camera will remain unaffected, letting me quickly go back to the same camera angle every time. With the render camera set up, I'm going to take a few moments to adjust some of the material settings. First I'm going to max out the tessellation slider to 2048. And then I'm going to tweak the scale of the displacement just a tad. After that, I go up to the texture dropdown and tweak the tiling and offset to give me the look I'm going for. Keep in mind, these settings work for me with this texture, 
but it might not work for yours, so don't be afraid to play with the settings until you're happy with the results. Next, I'll set the samples to 16 and turn off the filter settings. This removes the blending effect between pixels on the texture, and while it does make the texture look pixelated up close, it can give you a nice sharp effect from further away. Again, this is just a personal preference that varies from texture to texture. So it doesn't matter how good your texture is, if your lighting's bad, your material will not present well at all. If you hold down shift and the right mouse button, you can move the HDR sky around and see how it affects your material. As you can see, it's not all that interesting. That's because HDR images are meant to act more like indirect lighting and will never give you the hotter, more intense lights you get from an actual light source. For that, we need to add some lights to the scene, which we can do through the sky layer under the scene dropdown. Marmoset Toolbag comes with quite a few HDR skies that cover a variety of different settings, so you should easily be able to find something to fit your needs. For this example, I'm going to choose the Ennis House. The background is far too bright, so I'll drop the brightness slider down so that it doesn't wash out the material on the sphere. As you can see, the contrasted lighting of this HDR image will work nicely with the reflectivity of this metal material. Next, I'm going to bring up the overall brightness of the skylight, and then crank the child light brightness way up. I really like how this is looking, but before we add any lights, I want to tweak a few of the settings inside the camera's post effects menu. First and foremost, I want to change the tone mapping from linear to high L. Then I set sharpen to about 1.5 or 1.6. I also add a bit of vignetting to the scene. And then I'll tweak the curves a little bit to add some more contrast. Though the changes were minor, you can see it had a significant impact on the look and feel of the scene, which is exactly what I wanted. Alright, let's add some lights. If I click and drag on the HDR sky in the menu, it'll automatically add a light that is linked to the sky. I can edit the light I just added by clicking on the skylight one beneath the sky layer. I'll enable contact refinement, make the color white, and give the light a pretty high intensity. For renders like this, you'll always want a strong dominant light and at least one or two fill lights. In this case, I'll actually set up a second dominant light with the same settings, just from a slightly different angle. This is not a technique I use all the time, but in this case, it works pretty well. Next, I'll add a fill light from a much lower angle. I'll give the light a lower intensity than the dominant lights I just set up, and then give it a bluish hue. In most instances, I'd recommend keeping the colors on the desaturated side, but there are certainly cases where some dramatic colored lighting can really showcase a texture quite well. So again, it's up to you when to employ such tactics. Lastly, I'll add a light from below and reduce the brightness even more than the one before it. Okay, I think this lighting is looking pretty good, so now it's time to set up the finishing touches. First, I'm going to add a little bit of depth of field to the render camera. I'll enable the feature inside the render camera and then pull the near blur down to zero, then max out the bokeh. I can play with the focus distance slider, or I can actually just middle mouse click on the viewport to pick a focus distance based on my mesh. Once I'm happy with the focus distance, I'm going to go ahead and pull way back on the far blur until the effect is pretty subtle and limited to the edges of the sphere. Now that that's out of the way, I want to enable some settings in the render layer. I'll start by enabling the local reflections and internal refraction. I enable GI, but disable the specular aspect of it. And then lastly, I enable ambient occlusion, max out the strength, and then tweak the size. Alright, I think this is ready for a render. I'll go up to the capture menu and click on settings. Though it takes longer to render, I like to set the image dimensions quite high and then scale the image down afterwards. In the end, I think this generates a better image than just rendering at the final resolution, but this is definitely more of a personal preference. Then I'll move the sky around a little bit to find a nice lighting angle. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. So now I'll go back up to the capture menu and look at the different output options. First is image, which will render and save the file to your drive. Next is image and open, which will save the file to your drive and open it through your default image viewer. Then there's image to clipboard, which will put your render into the clipboard on your computer so that you can paste it directly into your photo editing software. And then lastly, you can export an image straight to ArtStation. But for this tutorial, I'm going to copy the image to the clipboard since I'll be pasting it straight into Photoshop for a quick resize. Alright, so say you want to render out a video with a spinning light to show how your material reacts to moving lights. 
But how do you do that? It's extremely simple. All you have to do is click on the sky layer and then click this turntable icon right here. Now if you go down to this play button here, you'll have a 300 frame or 10 second loop of the sky spinning 360 degrees. The turntable can also be added to your meshes, so if you'd rather the mesh spin instead of the lights, you can do it the same way by selecting the mesh and clicking on the turntable icon. Or you can just change the layer stack so that the mesh is inside the turntable group. But in this case, I want the sky to rotate, so I'll just relink the sky to the turntable layer. With the turntable set up, I'm going to go back to the capture settings menu and set my image dimensions to 1920 by 1080 so that I can position the camera accordingly. Alright, that'll work, so I'm going to go back to the settings again and crank up the quality. I'm fine with leaving the video at 1920 by 1080, but you can go up to the 4K resolution for your video renders if you wish. Then I hit OK. Now all I need to do is go to Capture, Video. Then click Export. After giving it a name, the video will render out. Even though the sphere works well in this case, sometimes you might want a floor to display your material on. So I'm going to show you how to quickly do that. First I'm going to delete the sphere mesh, and then import my floor plane FBX, and then drag the corrugated steel material onto the mesh. I then go ahead and position the camera to my liking. I adjust the displacement scale a tiny bit to work better for this new angle. I remove the previous lights by opening the sky layer and right clicking the lights on the HDR sky. And now I'll add my key light. And now some fills. I use the same basic principles for setting up the lights as I did before. But in this case, I'm making sure that the light sources are all higher up since I'm working with a floor plane. I rotate the sky a bit to check out my light placement and then do some final adjustments to the camera positioning. And now I'm ready to render. So I hope this tutorial was helpful in giving you a better understanding of how to quickly create some great looking renders inside Marmoset Toolbag. And remember, Every material will be different, so don't be afraid to play with your lighting, post-processing, and other settings to get the most out of your material. Also be sure to visit the forum linked below and post your own results there. We look forward to seeing what you create. Thanks for watching.